distinguished guests, dear friends and students. I remember, I demand. Armenians remember and demand. Every nation and every human being on earth should and must remember and demand the right of his fellow human being to live. The Armenian genocide was a crime against humanity and civilization, against a 6,000-year-old culture and nation. The Armenian genocide is not a part of history, but rather it is an undeniable reality. The recognition of the Armenian genocide by the Turkish government is a must for peaceful and good neighborly relations between Armenia and Turkey. Contrary to the denial policy of the Turkish government, many Turks in Turkey have been asking for asking the authorities to recognize the Armenian genocide. I remember, I demand, but I also believe that justice will be served. More than a century, more than 36,500 days, we, the Armenian nation, has been demanding recognition, reparation, and reconciliation. But what about tomorrow? What are the roles, rights, and duties of Armenians and other nations in the world? What do you think, ladies and gentlemen? Tonight, these questions will be addressed by our distinguished guest speaker, the world-renowned journalist, Robert Fisk. Fisk is the Middle East correspondent of the Independent Newspaper. He holds numerous awards for journalism, including two Amnesty International Awards, and seven British International Journalist of the Year Awards. During the 39 years he has been reporting on the Middle East, he has covered every major, every major event in the region, from the Algerian Civil War to the Iranian Revolution, from the hostage crisis in Beirut to the Iran-Iraq War, from the Russian invasion of Afghanistan to Israeli's invasion of Lebanon, and from the Gulf War to the invasion and ongoing war in Iraq. His books include The Great War for Civilizations, the conquest of the Middle East. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Robert Tiss. It is, of course, the 100th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide, or should I say the fact of the Armenian Genocide. Secondly, because you've invited a Brit to talk to you. <laughs> now, first of all, I have to say that, after all, it was one of my fellow countrymen, Viscount Bryce, who wrote the first major epic account of the Genocide during the First World War. And it was also another fellow countryman of mine, half American, in fact, called Winston Churchill, who first used the word Holocaust about the Armenian Genocide in a book in 1934. My dad, who was much older than my mother, was a soldier in the First World War. He ended up on the Somme not long after your forefathers and your great-grandparents were suffering their Golgotha in Turkish Armenia. And it was one of his books by Churchill that I found that quotation in and managed to put it around the world that Churchill used the word Holocaust about your people's genocide. But I also have to say that I do remember it was one of my fellow countrymen in response to the pleas of the Armenians in 1915 to save them from the Ottoman Turks who replied, our battleships, I'm afraid, don't climb mountains. And thus, of course, my people helped to doom you as they have helped to do other people in this region. I'm not, and here I might shock you a bit, I'm not terribly interested in the 100th anniversary of any event. 
I'm not terribly interested in the 100th anniversary of the Armenian Genocide. I'm not sure time exists. I think that for mass murders on the scale that the grandparents of many of you suffered, I'm not sure that time is a matter for them. And when you deny their deaths, as other countries, including Turkey and indeed, alas, Israel, I, when, when other people deny those deaths, I think they continue to die. I think that the dead of a genocide die every day, that their death is not acknowledged, which is why you must press on to have the world, all of the countries of the world, acknowledge that genocide. I'm, I'm kind of tired. I think it's a journalistic thing to have these, you know, the 70th anniversary of the start of World War II, the 100th anniversary last year of the start of World War I, um, you know, and, and now we're approaching the, um, the, the, the anniversary again, the 15th of, two, of 2000, uh, of 9-11, and so on. Because I think that if you look at the photographs of the genocide and do further research, we should see these people as dying yesterday. You know, I often say when I go to Sabra Shatila, the Palestinian camps in Beirut, when the Palestinians there get up in the morning amid dust and filth, for them, the Balfour Declaration was last night. And that's why they're sitting in dirt every morning. And I think that for you who still grieve, the Armenian genocide. I think it happened yesterday. I don't go in for 100th anniversaries. I'll tell you what I'll be doing on the 24th of April. I shall be in Istanbul, where a very brave group of Turks will be commemorating in Taksim Square, they intend, the genocide of the Armenians. On the 25th, I'll go to Gallipoli and watch the Turks and the British and the Australians and the New Zealanders celebrate a different anniversary. What I'm interested to know from you is not what you're going to do on April 24th this year. I want to know what you're going to do on April 25th and April 26th. And I want to know what you're going to do on the 101st anniversary and the 102nd anniversary of the Armenian Genocide. What comes next? OK, you've survived for the last hundred years, and you've kept the memory of the genocide alive. And I think you're winning. More and more European countries, more and more people I talk to, accept the fact of the Armenian genocide. And they know who did. Despite the cowardice of our politicians, and I include Mr. Obama, although of course being a Brit, I put Mr. Blair at the top of the list, in trying to avoid the reality of the Armenian genocide. By the way, if any of you can explain Tony Blair to me at the end of this talk. <laughs> I will possibly contribute $10 to you for your wisdom. I do not understand the guy. Mercifully, he's no longer the Middle East envoy. My goodness, I, when he was appointed, I thought it must be April Fool's Day. <laughs> you know, there was a, a, one of my colleagues in the Sunday Times, I hate to mention a rival newspaper of my own, The Independent, he wrote a very good piece some years ago in which he said that Tony Blair believed in God so much, didn't he ever get any advice from God? <laughs> like, you know, maybe the Iraq thing isn't such a good idea, Tony. But I suspect the communication between Blair and elsewhere was one way from him, of course. <laughs> but what I think I'm interested to know from you is what are you going to do in the next hundred years? You've reached the stage now, and I know this because I've been talking to real genocide survivors for 30 years or more. I've got film of them, which my wife took in the Armenian Old People's Home before they died. Last year in California, I saw a woman of 105 who at the tail end of the genocide in 1919 was sent from our home and almost died on a death march. But they're going. You don't have many survivors left. In 20 or 30 years' time, the same will apply to the Jews of the world. Their survivors from the Jewish genocide, Jewish Holocaust, will all be dead. As in a year or two, so will all of yours. What do you do when the living witnesses are no longer there? When you've got film, you've got pictures, you've got archives, yes. And the Armenian Genocide Museum is doing very well. I know that in Washington. 
but you need much more research. And I think that you need to keep alive the idea, not just that the victims of the genocide of 1915 were Armenians, they weren't just Armenians as we know, they were Syriac Christians as well, but the fact that is important is for the world to know that those who were killed and murdered in that genocide were human beings just like me or you or anyone else. The humanity of the people is why it is so terrible. Of course they were selected for death because they were Armenian Christians, but they were like me. They could have been my grandparents. And that is the message you need people in the world to understand, that they and you are the same. It could happen to them. It could have happened to them. In some cases, of course, it did. You know, one of the things that I'm very struck by when I look at the research is how few photographs we actually have of the genocide itself. Now, at that time, you know, the camera was high-tech. It was the YouTube of its time. It was the mobile phone of its time. My father actually took a camera to the trenches of the First World War. Maybe there was a bit of a journalist in him. Against all the military law, he took a camera. Everyone had cameras. Yet we have very few photographs of the Armenian genocide. We have photographs of the Armenians in their homes before the genocide. We have some poor photographs of Armenians being marched away, put on cattle trains. Some of them taken by um, uh, photographers who were working for the Deutsche Bank, because of course the German banks were supporting the Ottoman Empire. And we have Armen Wegner's pictures of the dead and dying. A brave man who, alas, although a hero to Armenians, and to me for his work on the Armenian genocide, lacks, I'm afraid to say, into fascism. He was hunting for Jews in Italy towards the end of his life in the Second World War, something which we didn't know, and which I found out by chance during my own researches into Wegner. But I think that the need to research more, to go deeper into the archives and the documents of the genocide, will do more than anything to make it a living thing, something that did not happen 100 years ago, but something that happened yesterday. I say this partly because in Yerevan, when I go to Armenia, the rum, poor rump state you were left with, I'm very, I'm very admiring of the genocide museum that Haku runs it. It's very interesting to see the way in which genocide researchers in Armenia are managing to find new photographs of your people's destruction. It's a very fascinating fact that you know Germans who took photographs of Armenian genocide victims, or those about to die. At the end of the First World War, under free passage, they were allowed to return to Berlin. And many of their photographs ended up in family albums in Germany. And they were still there in 1945 when the Red Army stormed into Berlin and thieved everything from camels at the zoo to tram cars because Russian soldiers also stole family albums from German homes. And some of those photographs were taken back to Moscow, where Armenian researchers are now trying to find them, one or two of which they had discovered. The pictures were taken as the Armenians were about to die in 45. In another giant epic tragedy of war, the Russians got them, took them back to what was then the Soviet Union, and now they are slowly returning to Yerevan. We need to see more pictures like this. We need to see more photographs, more archives. I got a letter sent to me, I see, 14th October 2013, it was a Monday, from an Armenian lady. Out of the blue, she wrote in reply to an article that I'd written in my newspaper. Reading further proof of Turkey's genocide in your article rang bells with me, she said. My grandparents left Czechoslovakia and went east, Baghdad, Aleppo, Beirut, Alexandria, Cairo, etc. They were mu mu musicians. In 1915-16, Papa, my grandfather, was called up to serve in the Austria-Hungarian army of course, fighting alongside Ottoman, Turkey, and Germany against the Allies. And she goes on to say, 
It was learned that the Turks were coming and massacring Christians. And my grandmother's neighbor was a Jewish lady, and she rushed round to her house and gave her a Star of David to wear. When the knock on the door came, my grandmother opened it and brandished the Star of David around her neck, and she wasn't touched by the Turks. This, you see, is a very precious piece. This is a real letter, a precious piece of your history. I kept it because, of course, I understand its importance. But there are many letters and memories like this which we don't know exist, which are not there. I'm researching at the moment for a new book, the companion volume to The Great War for Civilization. I call it the companion volume because if you've bought the first book, that means you'll buy the second. <laughs> it's a journalistic trick, but it might work. Anyway, I'm also researching in there again about the Armenians. And I'm discovering many, many written accounts by British soldiers which are coming out now or have never been seen since these accounts were first written and published in the immediate aftermath of the First World War, which are not in the Genocide Museum in Washington. Take the case, for example, of Alec Glenn. He was a British Army doctor in the 1418 war, and he wrote a book privately for his sons, who just published it and sent it to me, and it records the further agony of the Armenians no Armenian researcher, I fear, has found this, but I've got it. So listen for the first time of a new description in the last days of the genocide. We're moving towards the end of the First World War. About this time, 1918, we began to pass many thousands of Armenians who were refugees. This is on the Iraqi Persian border. Sometimes we will pass several thousand in a day. It was an amazing and tragic sight. There were old men and women and children, some riding on donkeys and some riding on cows. The younger ones walked and pushed barrows with their belongings. Now and then we passed at the roadside a dying person, or one already dead and half eaten by dogs and jackals. We could do nothing for them, but we lifted some of the younger ones who looked as if they might recover onto our mules and carried them forward to the next village. Our dumpster force, that was the name of the British unit he was in, had arranged posts in most of the villages where rations were handed out to the Armenian refugees and some primitive arrangements were made for looking after the sick. Salisbury Craig, a doctor who was a friend of his, told me later that he attended an old Armenian refugee in the road who, before he, he died, gave him a leather belt full of golden sovereigns and he asked him to spend the money to help the refugees. Greater love hath no man than this. Here's an account by a British soldier. He wasn't lying about the genocide. This is the truth. We're not relying here on Armenian documentation, valid though totally 100% it is. Move elsewhere. There were many thousands of Australian and New Zealand troops who witnessed what this man witnessed on the Iraqi-Persian border. This is material that is gold in the memory of history for Armenians. Sadly, as I learned in Yerevan, Stalin also did his bit to erase the memory of the massacres. Armenian Tashnag party, of course, so prominent in Armenian politics in the Ottoman Empire, was banned by the Soviets. Those refugees who reached what is now Armenia in 1990, once the Soviets came, many tens of thousands of them threw away their own photographs of their families and burned their documents and diaries. Stalin doesn't come out of the Armenian genocide story very well. He wasn't responsible for it, but he was responsible for a lot of the erasure of memory. An old, old copy of a book by Captain Sarkis Torosyan, a name that I think you will know, a brave Armenian soldier of Gallipoli, where I will also be on the 25th of April, writing about the Armenians, of course, from Gallipoli. Captain Tarosyan not only was a highly decorated officer in the Turkish army who fought with distinction, was wounded at Gallipoli. He went on to fight the Allies in Palestine, but was appalled to find thousands of dying Armenian refugees in the deserts of northern Syria. In passages of great pain, he discovers his sister living in rags and tells how his fiancée, Jamila, died in his arms. I raised Jamila in my arms, he wrote, 
the pain and terror in her eyes melted until they were bright as stars again. Stars in an oriental night. And so she died as a dream passing. These are the books and memories that you need to cherish a bit more. There's very little mention of Torosian in the West. There is in my newspaper, because I write about him all the time. But this is an important figure in history, and it is Captain Torosian, which I shall be writing about from Gallipoli on the 25th of April. So, I go back again and again to the idea of further research. I have a book, I made a copy of it because I thought you might be interested, called Armenians in India, published in the 19th century. Here is a passage, actually, from an old English newspaper published in Calcutta about the Armenians of Afghanistan. Do you know there was an Armenian community in Afghanistan? It is just possible, this reporter writes, needless to say this British newspaper was called The Englishman, published in Calcutta, it is just possible that a very interesting discovery of ancient manuscripts will probably be made. As one result of the Emir's, Emir of Afghanistan, visit to Calcutta, attention has been directed towards a small community of Christians from Armenia who had been living in Kabul for very many generations. Did you know that? I didn't. Hands up anyone who knew there were Armenians in... Well, there are a few brave people, but not many. These people in the time of the late Amir, Abdul Rahman, had dwindled down to ten families. They were, for reasons unknown, banished to Peshawar, Peshawar today, and brought down with them a collection of manuscripts said to be of immense antiquity. Indeed, they are so old that none of the families possessing them are able to read them anymore. It appears that the priesthood had died out amongst these Christians in Kabul, and the community was too remote to be able to get priests from elsewhere, hence the neglect of the sacred writings. In the traditional history of Armenia, reference is made to an Afghan country, where the early Christians found a refuge from persecution. See how it tracks all the way back. It has been hitherto thought that by Afghan country was meant the mountainous regions of Georgia, but it would be strange indeed if it were now discovered that it was in Kabul, supposed for so many years to be the very center of fanaticism, that the flame of the Christian faith was kept alive when it was being ruthlessly trampled out elsewhere. In any case, an examination by experts of the manuscripts, now said to be in Peshawar, should yield some valuable results. The families themselves are unaware of the history of the first settlement in Kabul, except that it dates back to the very earliest times, and from then, to that persecution. Again, this is part of the original historical narrative, something that led to the events, as the Turks sometimes call them, of what happened to the fact of the Armenian genocide. I want to show you now, I'm going to show you, and I'll say it when I want the lights down, I'm going to show you three photographs. I doubt if many of you have actually seen these pictures, but I'll just tell you a little bit about them. They were taken with a German camera by a man called Victor Pitchman. Victor Pitchman was an Austrian soldier attached to the Turkish army, so he knew what was happening. And the pictures he took, one after the other, were of a convoy of Armenians on the death road from Erzurum. We know that all the people on this convoy died. They did not survive. So we've got many pictures of the Armenians before the genocide. Some fairly blurry pictures, what else can we expect, even with fingerprints on, of some expulsions from cities. And we've got pictures of dead and dying Armenians taken by Wagner. But these people, whom you're going to see now, your people, are still alive. Obviously, they've been expelled from their homes. They have dark thoughts of the future, but they don't know what their future is. We do not know if Mr. Pitchman Victor Pitchman, who took the photographs, knew what their fate was to be. But I'd like to show you the sequence of three pictures. There is virtually no footage, movie film, of the genocide except of orphans afterwards. I think there is some footage of the genocide, and I'm still trying to find it in France, at least the results of the genocide in terms of burning buildings. But in these three pictures, we are taken, so to speak, on a photographic narrative as you see the people pass you. Now perhaps we can put the lights down and actually show the first of the pictures. Here you see 
Run a beautiful tree in the background, distant mountains. This is the road south of Erzurum. And these are the Armenians, mules. I think there's some camels down there, certainly horses. They've still got some of their, their possessions with them. They haven't yet had the animals and the money taken from them. But within days and perhaps hours, these people will die. Now, look at this field on the right. It's trampled down. This is not the first convoy of its time. There are many others that have been on the death march. You can see those objects on the left. When I studied this picture with a microscope, they appear to be shoes that obviously fell off people who are now walking barefoot in front of this convoy, if they are still alive. Can we move to the second picture? As the convoy moves on, Victor Pitchman takes more photographs. Here's his next one, the same tree. Look at the field. Again, you see what appear to be shoes or items of clothing. Incredibly, you can't see the people's faces. The sun was too white on the other side. But these are the Armenians about to die. They are heading for their Golgotha, and we do not know what they know, knew. Or did the photographer know? Is that why he took the pictures? We shall never know. But what you're looking at is the kind of narrative photographically, as a result of research by Haik at the Genocide Museum in uh, Yerevan, that we need to continue the living memory of what happened in 1915, long after we've all died of old age, hopefully. Can we have the last picture? Now they're actually passing Victor Pitchman. You can almost see the faces. The wheels, the wagons are still there. You can still see the discarded shoes, or items of clothing. You see another wagon in the past was obviously past this bit of field here. And this is a unique series of pictures. This is the moment of truth. These people are going to die shortly. And we have virtually, had, as a matter of interest, how many people in this room have seen these pictures before? Nobody. I thought not. This is the kind of photograph you need to keep finding. The more research you can do into this, the more powerful and the more important becomes the memory of the genocide. None of you lived through it. But sometimes listening to the survivors in the past, I felt I knew what it was like. We can see them on film, of course, but the discovery of new photographs like this tell us so much. You can see the state of the people. You do not know what's going on in their minds. Man still has his jacket on. In some, one of the previous pictures, there was a woman on the cart. The, the, the men are walking, the women are being given the carts to ride on. Although there is a picture of a woman further down in the background there who's walking. So those are the only three pictures I wanted to show you tonight, just to try and impress upon you the importance of the continued research to find new photographic evidence which is irrefutable of the fact of the genocide. This is how the genocide lives on, and this is how history continues. I'm not trying to preach at you, journalists do far too much of that, but you see the point I'm making. You put the lights up if you can now, and that's fine, thank you. So I'm going to spell around behind you here. Now I come to the tasteful question of denial of the genocide. <clears throat> Let me tell you, first of all, a story about a Turkish friend of mine. In 1999, when the Turkish earthquake took place, I went to Istanbul to cover the whole Bosphorus area. Of course, tens of thousands of people died, some say 93,000, and figures of different. But while I was there, the first place I went to when I got off my MEA flight to Istanbul from Beirut, I went to an area in the suburbs of Istanbul, and there was standing in front of this rubbleized house a Turkish man holding his young daughter by the hand. And he spoke good English, so I said, who are you? And he said, I'm in Turkey's top government experts, expert, he said, on earthquakes. And do you know, he said, they won't even pay for my taxi fare to come and look at the earthquake damage. So what did I do? I said, from now on, for the next week, you're working for the independent newspaper. And I will pay your tax fare, and I'll drive you. So he stayed with me for a whole week as we went round these devastated Turkish cities. And I got incredible reports, because I was with the man who knew about earthquake. On the last day, and here I come down to the Armenian part of the story, I said to him, my paper will take you and your family, bring 20 guests, friends and family, we're all going to have lunch on the Bosphorus. You, you choose the restaurant. So we had a very big lunch, and a very big bill. But at the beginning of the lunch, before I said, stop, before you touch 
the red wine. I think the red wine is buzbag in Turkey was their favorite. And the beautiful fish. I said, before you start eating, the Armenian genocide. <laughs> and the waiter, I thought he was going to drop the glasses. He just froze like this beside the table. And my friend was sitting at the other end of the table, Turk, a Turk to his bones. And he, by now, we knew each other very well. He said, Robert, and he opened his arms and said, we all know the Armenian genocide is a fact of history. It happened. And they all not and agree around the table. So they know, you know, they don't believe the propaganda. They know it's all true. And of course, we know now in Turkey, more and more Turkish people are finding Incredibly, that they have Armenian great-grandmothers. Now, how could that be, I wonder? Why, did it, why was it that around the period of 1915, all these Turks suddenly wanted to marry and have children with Armenians? Did something happen in 1915? And that's what many Turks are now asking. Bravery, and rightly so. There are now books being published in Turkish on this very subject. But let me go back to the question of denial. First of all, in my researches, I've got hold of a private Foreign Office document drawn up for the British government by a man called Michael Attenborough, if you want to know, not related to the other Attenboroughs, I hope, in the International Affairs and Defence Department of the Foreign Office. So here's what he said. He's putting forward the UK position from his own researches. This is what British ministers follow, right? The date of this is the 19th of June 2007. Is on House of Commons paper. <coughs> it has proved extremely dis difficult to disentangle the truth of the Armenian genocide, and the issues remain the subject of considerable controversy. It's always heated debate. If you read Reuters, they're always talking about hotly debated genocides. Observers, this is the document again, are far from unanimous as to whether the massacres and deaths that occurred during the deportations constitute an official campaign of genocide presumably as opposed to an unofficial campaign of genocide, perpetrated by the Ottoman authorities. Well, who else was running Turkey at the time? And then he goes on, the British government's position on the issue of the events, he means the problem, doesn't he, of 1915-16 has been reiterated on many occasions. Officially, the government acknowledges the strength of feeling about what it describes as a terrible episode of history. Haram, you Armenians, right? You were, you, were, you were involved in the terrible events of history, episode of history, and recognizes the massacres of 1915-16 as, quote, a tragedy, like the Armenian victims were destroyed by an earthquake or maybe a giant flood. However, neither the current government nor previous British governments have judged the evidence is sufficiently unequivocal to persuade them that these events should be categorized as genocide. What was the Bryce report about in the First World War, published by the same British Foreign Office? You see, this bending of history is very easy. Just find someone who disagrees, and you can have a controversy, and therefore you can't confirm. I mean, you only have to say to CNN, what's the Israeli point of view about what happened in Gaza last year? And suddenly, it's a controversial event. Even though more than 2,000 Palestinians were killed, it becomes controversial, it's in dispute, and therefore not worthy of an opinion until the dispute has been finished, which it never will be, as long as you play what I call 50-50 journalism, which is okay if you're reporting a football match or a public inquiry into a new motorway, but does not and should not apply to the Middle East. This stuff goes on and on. Here we are again. This is a highly emotive issue. You bet it is. A minute and a half day, that murder, that really is quite emotive, isn't it? Which provokes strongly held and often polarized views. Accounts of the period of history in question are by no means clear cut. To which my reaction was, didn't the Ottomans kill enough Armenians for the British to accept? You know, where does this go on to? And as with every such situation, there are not many others, are there? There are differing interpretations. I got, I got the worst of this, you know, in Canada, when I was lecturing there on Armenian Genocide Day in 2010. Now, my newspaper, by the way, The Independent, we not only call it a genocide, we call it the Armenian Holocaust with a capital H. You can imagine the ripples that makes, but we do, and it's printed that way in my newspaper. 
I don't want to waste too much time on the cowardice of the West, but let me just recall what Barack Obama said before he became president in 2008. The Armenian genocide is not an allegation, a personal opinion, or a point of view, but rather a widely documented fact supported by an overwhelming body of historical evidence. He really needed the Armenian vote, didn't he? The facts are undeniable. As a senator, I strongly support the passage of the Armenian Genocide Resolution, and as president, I will recognize the Armenian Genocide. Unquote. He lied. <laughs> didn't he? What happened when Obama became the president? Marabe Dictu. It turned out that the Armenians were massacred, but it wasn't a genocide. The word simply disappeared. I'll give you a personal account of what it feels like to get involved in the denial business. I was interviewed the day of my talk by CTV, Canadian Television, not CBC, the state-owned company, but the other commercial channel. And I was stunned to hear the genocide described on the program in which I was being interviewed as deadly massacres. Think about that word. As opposed to undeadly massacres. <laughs> where the victims get up and walk away when the TV show is over. I mean, seriously, they call it deadly massacres. When I condemned the television station for using this phrase at the lecture I gave, in which the directors of the TV company were sitting in the front row, I was abused by CTV journalists for stepping way out of line. I wasn't out of line at all. I was telling the truth. They were lying. It wasn't a deadly massacre, it was a genocide. The fact that genocide wasn't a word that had been invented in 1915 doesn't change that. We can talk about the massacres of the Crusaders, I doubt if they used the word massacre at the time. So it was a deadly massacre. The same day in the Toronto Globe and Mail, we had a reporter, or a writer called Jeffrey Simpson, who advanced an argument about the Armenian genocide, which if used about Jewish victims of the Nazis, would have pleased Adolf Hitler. He was saying that the Armenian Canadians who were protesting at the lack of recognition of the genocide Multiculturalism can be dangerous if diaspora politics twist Canada's foreign policy to suit ethnic demands. In other words, deny the genocide and don't offend the Turkish community in Canada, which are very large in Toronto and which are great viewers of Canadian television, of course. And so it goes on and on and on. And what's interesting is that the moment you attack the deniers, they abuse you mainly because they're not used to being attacked, I suspect. And so we go on more research, but one other thing has to happen, I think, in the coming years. Start on April 25th this year. We need to talk much more to people like my Turkish friend, who acknowledges and knows that it was all true, the genocide. I'm not just talking about the brave academics like Tan Hakkacan, uh, I'm meeting one of his colleagues in Istanbul for the Armenian Genocide Memorial in Istanbul. I'm talking about thinking of other Turks. The Turks mentioned in the Bryce report who behaved, few though they were, bravely with, and with honour and protected Armenians during the genocide. What if the Armenians were to honour those brave Turks and invite the Turkish authorities to honour them too? An interesting question, isn't it? Because you don't need me to tell you this, but I'm going to say it just the same because I like to hear this. If the Turks don't honour their own brave people, it tells you quite a lot about the government. And if they do honour the brave Turks who helped to save the Armenians, they are acknowledging the genocide. I think more and more now that there are brave enough Turks in Turkey. This is a country who fought in Korea, and unlike the British and Americans, not one Turkish soldier was brainwashed. I always say on Turkish television, which I have done, you're a tough, brave people. You're brave enough to acknowledge the genocide. Interesting thought. I want to go back now briefly, because I've got a film not to show you now, but I do have a film of this man. I want to read to you a passage which I've written 
about many times because it's still deeply moving to me. It's of an Armenian called Harutiun Kebejan. He's long dead now. I met him, he's blind, I met him in the old people's home in East Beirut, the Armenian old people's home. And he gave me his memories, which I've used many times to try to get across to readers, not just what happened in the genocide, but perhaps an attitude which we need to think more about in the future. When I say we, I mean all of us who believe in the truth of history. This is what he said to me. We lived in Dortyol. My father was called Sakis, and my mother was Marian. There were ten children, including me and my brothers and sisters. The, the Turks collected all the people with their donkeys and horses. We were to go to Aleppo and Russell Ain, but they started killing us on the way. The Turks forced us to the Hubble River, and by the time we got there, there was only my mother and my sister and me left. They told the women and the men to take off all their clothes. My sister was 18, and a man on a horse came and grabbed her and put her on his horse. He did this in front of us. It happened in front of my eyes. I was not blind in those days. And they started to beat my mother. As she begged them not to take my sister, the Turks beat her to death. I have always remembered that as she died, she screamed my name, Harutiun! Harutiun! Later, an Arab Bedouin took me to his house and I stayed there for three years. The war was over, and then people came saying they were looking for Armenian orphans. I said I was Armenian, so they took me to Aleppo. There I caught a virus that affected my eyes. I was suddenly blind, and I was only 11 years old. Until I was 23, I was filled with rage because the Turks took my sister and beat my mother in front of my eyes until she died. But when I was 23, I felt this was not the right way to be a man. So I began to pray to God so he would see me. I was making peace with myself. Now I'm ready to meet my God. I am at peace. Last year, this was, he's talking about 1999, when the big earthquake happened in Turkey, it killed so many Turks, and I prayed to God for those Turks. I prayed for those poor Turkish people. Those words should be written in stone. That's a magnificent guy. And I suspect more men like him and the Turks may change quicker than you think. And I'll tell you one reason, and make you smile at the end of our conversation this evening. I'll tell you one reason why. When my book came out in Turkish, in the Turkish language, the whole Armenian chapter was included, translated into Turkish. And of course, I got a Turkish speaker to check it over. And needless to say, I chose an Armenian Turkish speaker to check it over. It was perfect. They didn't change a word. I went to Turkey for the launching of the Turkish edition of this book, and I did 21 television radio interviews. I talked about the Armenian genocide till the cows came out. <laughs> Only once, from a producer, before we went on air, did I get an objection. And I told him basically to clear off what I was going to make, say what I wanted to say. But here's the key to end this evening with a slight smile on your face. On the last day I was in Turkey, I went to the Istanbul Book Fair. Of course, a journalist selling his book, and to sign copies. And we had a long queue of Turks who'd seen me talking about the Armenian genocide on television and wanted me to sign the book. But one young man came up to me, impeccable English, very well educated, Turkish of course, and he said, my father saw, saw you talking about the Armenian genocide on television last night, and he asked me to ask you to sign the book for him. So I thought, very nice chap, and I was about to sign. I said, I'm interested, what does your father do? And he said, he said to me, he's the Istanbul chief of police. <laughs> and I signed the book, and I thought to myself, they're changing. I didn't really want to go to Turkey. I was doing another story at the time, but it was my wife who said, you have a chance to change people. Go. And when I left Turkey and called my wife and told her this story, she said, I told you you were right to go. <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your patience and listening to me.
appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Robert. And thank you for being sick, brother. I appreciate that. Now it's time, it's time that you ask questions, please, and we'll take, we'll take a few questions, as many as possible. We can take every single question. Please go ahead. You mean a mic? Who's got a mic? Where's a mic? You got a mic? Right. This lady will bring the mic to you. If you have, there's always a wonderful moment when no one wants to ask a question. And I think that like a rat, I can sneak off. Anyone want to ask any questions? Great. Okay, go ahead. Um, if the Armenians, in your opinion, 
would ever get their land and belongings back. Well, you're not coming down, so I get it. Well, back then you said that the Jews waited for 2,000 years to get it, so you'll get it sooner or later. I think what I told you is that the Jews of Europe, whose families were sent to the gas chambers, had to wait a long time to get reparations from the new German government. I did not talk about 2,000 years in Palestine. I, I certainly referred to the Jews having to wait an outrageous amount of time to be in any way compensated for their suffering under the Nazis. I certainly said that. So what would your answer be now regarding pretty much the compensation the same. Look, uh, pretty much the same. Time action is right. The fact of the matter is this. The Turkish state was the direct legal successor to the Ottoman Empire. What would you do if Germany today, under our friend Angela Merkel, suddenly said, there wasn't a Holocaust to Jews, it was part of a civil war. There was, the, the Jews were arrested during a very turbulent period. Every ambassador in Berlin would be withdrawn. Recognition would disappear from Germany. And rightly so, she said that. But the Turks do say it. And we have all our embassies in Ankara, no problem at all. The fact of the matter is this. I think Turkey actually should join the European Union. I'm all for Turkey joining. You know, so many Europeans were very racist people when they wanted me to say, oh, the Turks, they speak their own language, they don't care about us, they live in their little ghettos. What? When Turkey wants to join us, how can you say that? But they've got to acknowledge the Armenian genocide as part of the price of joining the European Union. And make sure that they can no longer use the law to oppress the Kurds. Then, I would welcome every Turk as a European like me. They're in the continent of Europe anyway. Why not in the European Union? But I think the problem is this. Ataturk, and I've spent so much of my time reading biographies of Ataturk. Ataturk, who was quite a humorous man in his way, he was not directly involved in the genocide, but his comrades were. And some of the people who were with him in the foundation of the Turkish state had blood on their hands. And that's why the mere mention of the genocide means that you are abusing Ataturk himself. You see, there's a connection politically. But no, the real problem is this. If the European Union includes Turkey, every Armenian in Europe can say, well, we'd like our house back, please, or could we have some compensation? And they can go and find it. I've been with Armenians and found their homes in what is now Turkey, in what was Western Armenia. And why shouldn't they have reparations? It was only a few years ago that American insurance companies were prepared to pay up on Armenian lives that had been insured before the genocide. And even then, the insurance companies and banks wouldn't call it genocide. They called it events, tragic events they were paying up for. The Turks, of course, wanted the insurance money originally in 1915, as we know. Find it in the Bryce Report, find it in um, the American ambassadors, and around etc. I think it has a lot to do with financing, but I'm sure the Americans would pay it if necessary. <laughs> Let's take a question from that side. There is a question. This side? Okay. Uh, there's a gentleman up there. Okay. Okay. Afterwards. Yeah. Okay. okay. Um, excuse me, sir. Um, I'm sure my question is not as interesting as her topic or his question, but it's just out of curiosity. Um, these pictures that you keep getting from Russia, from everywhere, from France maybe, how are you sure? How do you determine? Because three over four of these pictures do not have a background. How are we sure that they are of the Armenian genocide, maybe? Like, the world was at chaos at that time. Look, when, like the Armenian Genocide Museum in Yerevan, goes to find the person who had the pictures and knows where they came from, and believe me, they have annotation in German on the, on the album saying what they took the pictures of, you know, Mr. Pitchman, who took those pictures, he did not live in the age of Photoshop. He didn't live in the age of you know, manufacturing mountains. And I don't think the Genocide Museum is. I've, I've gone through thousands of photographs in my work as a journalist, some of which have been fake. Um, and in many cases, it's been the peoples who've suffered uh, in their families, the destruction of a whole race of people, who've discovered the fakes. Um, I was actually, at one point, writing about German railways and the knowledge of German railwaymen, the agent drivers, as to whether they knew they were taking Jews to Auschwitz. Answer, of course, they did. Um, although the agent drivers were switched before they came to the camp. One photograph allegedly showed uh, Jews in an open truck uh, at Hamburg railway station. 
the main Bahnhof Central Station, and ordinary passengers in another train who could see them. And the, the point, of course, of the photograph was to say that, um, of course, every German knew what was happening. Now, I think every German did know that the picture was real, but it wasn't taken in the Second World War. It was taken in Hamburg in 1946, and these were Germans who had been uh, who fled from Eastern Germany when the Russians came in, being trucked off to new places by the British authorities in Hamburg. So the photograph was correct, but the date was wrong. But in fact, um, I, was, I was helped in discovering the fraudulence of the caption by, in fact, a Jewish researcher. So it's very often um, people who were so deeply involved in the tragedy of their own people. And I don't think that there's any Armenian researcher I've met, certainly not Hague, for example, who would, who would not search very diligently that these are the real pictures. Um, I mean, even, even Armin Wegner, uh, I've only discovered in the last few months researching for my new book, um, that he pops up in an Italian town hunting for a Turkish Jewish man who was on the run in Italy. And the only reason he didn't find him was because the Jewish man died of sickness before he got to him. So there's even a bad, a dark side to Armin Wegener, I'm sorry to say. Um, you know, you can't clean up history, you can't wash it. Um, but I, I, I'm satisfied those photographs are 100%. Um, and that's why I wouldn't show them to you. There's more pictures than that. Yeah, yeah, there's a whole reel. No, I mean, the background thing was part of the, of the um, part of the convincing quality of the pictures for me, because first of all, it was the same background in each picture. <laughs> if you're going to fake it, you couldn't do that. And secondly, uh, people who've been to that part, so I've been to Earthland, but I've not been on the road south. That is the countryside, flat countryside, mountains and distance. I don't see any reason to doubt the, the, uh, the, the, the authenticity of this picture. Okay. okay. We need to manage them successfully, please. Yes, please, from there. Uh, Doctor, I would like to ask something about the uh, real Armenian genocide. Some writers uh, said that the, the real genocide started in 1894. Yeah, yeah. Why? I, I don't why do they say that? Because that's when the first massacre is No, I, I mean, why uh, some people, some actually the, the writers are saying about uh, the real genocide started in 1915. About the lines, about the lines. Oh, I, I, I'll explain the difference. There had yeah. been for many years under the Sultanate individual massacres of Armenians in various parts of Turkey. Uh, the Turks themselves have published British documents about this written by British diplomats in uh, Constantinople, then of course Istanbul now, which was then the capital, uh, about this. But the idea of the genocide was that the young Turkish movement, in particular the three famous pashas, it was their direct decision and their orders were to destroy the Armenian people, and that happened in 1915. Their cover, of course, was Gallipoli. That was to put people's mind. This was the moment to kill the Armenian Christians. I have to say, and I didn't mention it earlier, I do sometimes find parallels between what happened to the Armenians and what has happened to some people under ISIS today. Uh, I was very... I, I spoke to Armenian clergy in commission last year in October. Uh, one of them went back to his uh, church and found his library with six inches of ash on the floor. And he was able to tell me that the and confirmed to me that the Basilica in Derizor, which is specifically there as a memorial now to the Armenian genocide, the bones have been taken out of the crypt and thrown into the street. Um, Almost 30 years ago, just over 30 years ago, I actually went to the Hubble River, which is now ISIS territory, of course, and managed uh, to dig up quite a lot of skeletons uh, in what had been the riverbed. I couldn't find the killing field at the beginning because it was next to a river. What had happened was there were so many corpses in the river that the river had changed the course and it was now a mile away. But we found the corpses and the bones and skulls that I found, um, I took to the Armenian church in Derazor, and those bones and skulls have now been thrown into the street by, actually by Muslim, not by ISIS, not that he wants to make that much of a difference. These were young people I found, they all had perfect sets of teeth, so they were teenagers or people in their 20s, probably women as well as men. Okay, yes please. I would like to argue the matter of some people who doubt the Armenian genocide. I ask myself, what are we doing here? 
I can't hear you. Louder, louder, please. I thought uh, 